Welcome to the Three Degrees of Freedom podcast, where we explore lifestyle engineering with our expert guests to bring you in alignment with your own three degrees of freedom, location, time, and financial independence. Hello, everyone. So today's guest is Sam Keller. Hey, Sam, how are you today? Hey, I'm great. Really happy to be with you. Awesome. Awesome. For those who don't know Sam, you're going to love this conversation. Sam is a seasoned entrepreneur and sustainability advocate with over two decades of experience in finance, renewable energy, real estate, and hospitality. Sam's recently been working with families who live in temporarily in extraordinary destinations with communities, building confidence, bordering, broadening horizons, and becoming aligned with their life goals. This is where Working Without Borders enters the picture. It's a public benefit corporation that allows uh, families to live abroad in amazing locations. And after fulfilling his dream of moving his family to Tahiti during the pandemic, Sam's passion for entrepreneurship and sustainability has led him to speak at the United Nations and appear on the Today Show. And so join us as we discuss Sam's journey and how he is helping families achieve the three degrees of freedom, location, time, and financial and so let's just start with your diverse background. I want to talk about how that kind of cultivated into starting your business, Working Without Borders. How did that materialize from all these seemingly very different backgrounds, finance, renewable energy, real estate, hospitality? How did that come to be eventually Working Without Borders? Yeah. After years of doing the things you mentioned and others, seven years at the private sector arm of the World Bank, financing ecotourism lodges and so forth, and developing renewable energy projects and other things. When the pandemic hit, my wife and I got to achieve our long-held dream of living abroad when we moved our family to the island of Tahiti. And while there, I got to reflect in that inspiring environment about where my heart and soul really were and what I wanted to do next. And we saw how the world was evolving with obviously more and more people able to work from home during the pandemic and work remotely. We saw the demand for travel becoming pent up. We knew that eventually we would emerge out of that pandemic and folks would be able to travel for more extended periods. And so essentially what we first did was put together a month long program on the island of Morea the sister island of Tahiti, one of the world's most beautiful. And last year, my family and 13 others from all over North America went to live on that island for a month. It was a program in conjunction with UC Berkeley and the scientific research station they have on the island. Parents were able to work remotely. We had all that dialed in, both in their accommodations and a co-working space we had set up. Meanwhile, the teens had a very culturally enriching program with the local teens there. And we had also set up, a arranged for a, a kids camp. So we did that. We then did a, a similar program in Costa Rica. Now this summer, we've got families heading to Medellin, Colombia, to the Sacred Valley of Peru. <laughs> um, so it's evolved now into this company, Working Without Borders. And basically, we make it easier, more feasible for families, whether it's a single mom and a kid or two parents and a bunch of kids, but to really get a sense of what it's like to live in another culture, not just to go on vacation, be tourists, but to, to actually live there and get groceries and see a local doctor if somebody gets sick and to really be immersed with the other local families, but to do it in a way in which you've got this community of like-minded, like-valued families who are along for the ride with you. This is such an incredible idea because the main objection that I get when I'm talking to people about creating location freedom is, oh, I've got kids, I can't travel. And that's something that maybe we can dive into just a little bit about how this all works. And I know that it makes sense to me that you're, you're creating these communities, but I guess before we go there, I'm curious, you made a, a really quick leap. You said, oh, it's time for us during the pandemic. Is let's, go to, let's go to South America. Let's just go travel for a little bit. And then you said, let's start inviting other people to go. And so what I'm curious is like, where did the kernel of this idea come? Did you have this intention as soon as the pandemic started to be like, hey, let's try to take like this family, this 
remote living concept and inspire other people to do it alongside us so that we can at least you know, have a community where we're all talking with each other. Did, is that how that evolved? Or did you go there first to the location and you're like, boy, it'd be really great to have something where, you know, there's like a local community and we're enjoying the culture, but we still have like this, we're, this travel abroad community together in one place. How, how did yeah, that yeah. start? Okay, great. First off, our move to French Polynesia during the pandemic, that arose yeah. from my wife and I for literally over 20 years, wanting to live abroad, not being able to figure out how to happen, how to make mm. it happen. But the pandemic hit and she's a pretty senior person at Airbnb. She had license then to go work from anywhere. I was able to do so also. So we just went for it. And our kids were able to have in-person schooling right on the lagoon, stingray swimming by, and then learning how to paddle outrigger canoes in the lagoon with sea turtles and dolphins. It was phenomenal. So we were there for 10 months, incredible cultural experience. And we basically wanted to make that kind of thing feasible for more families. And mm -hmm. Even upon returning to California, where I currently reside, we still wanted to have that kind of experience be part of our lives and our kids' upbringing. Yeah. In developing Working Without Borders, it was the idea of let's take advantage of where the world is evolving. Let's solve a, a problem that exists, which you had mentioned, gosh, how do we do this? How do we do this with kids and community? Other companies had been doing these kind of co-working retreats for years, unsettled remote year and so forth, but they don't allow kids. So there was basically this gap in the market that needed to be filled. And so we've created it. And now my family gets to, to benefit from these programs. And we get to provide something really exciting and deeply fulfilling and tr transformative in some cases for all these other families. This is so cool. I cannot wait to ask you some more questions to dive into this, but I still want a little bit more background here because something like this is a really Im impressive and really amazing endeavor in, in my mind, just because it's so inspiring for you to be able to give back in this way to be able, how can we create structures to help provide this to other people? You have all these diverse backgrounds, right? You're working in all these different industries. And I think your spouse, you said, is working at Airbnb. This is hilarious. I, I actually talked with someone yesterday who was also an executive at Airbnb who left their job a couple months ago and is now also locationally independent with their kids. And they're also in the Bay Area. So maybe after the show, I'll see if I can maybe connect you guys and see if you yeah. know each other. Anyway, yeah. how did your mindset evolve while you were creating this company and going through this business? Because unless I'm mistaken, it sounds like you had a very corporate, both you and your wife had a very corporate mm -hmm. background, right? Yeah. And now you're in this thing where you're, you've got kids, you're abroad. And now all of a sudden you're like, Hey, let's, let's make something happen. Let's do a business. So what type of mindset shift needed to happen maybe with you and maybe with your entire family to help create what working without borders is today? Yeah. First, let me say, in my background, I had been with some fairly large companies, but also some startups. And so Got I had cool. the early stage startup entrepreneurial experience to, That's good. To, to, to leverage. But basically, we were of the mindset, first off, that if you uh, focus enough on anything, you can figure it out. So that basic uh, belief. And also the idea that Man, if you can figure out something where there's a, a real need, you're serving something beyond yourself, and it really ties in with your passion, your heart and soul, then you're going to have enough juice and fuel to get through the difficult times to really build it up. And in this case, this is something that really benefits my own family, and it provides something that's tremendously exciting for the families that are going off to these countries for a month. So a lot of juice to, to get it going. And in our case, my wife has continued to be at Airbnb. So we've got the stability financially in, in that regard. We've also done a lot of real estate investment, which is, has helped. So we can make it work financially. We're at a point now where the current Airbnb policy is that she's able to work 
anywhere within the United States with the same salary, but their policy is that they can employees can spend 90 days each year in other countries. So that affords us the opportunity to do several of our programs. Meanwhile, I can run Working Without Borders uh, and the other things I'm involved with from anywhere, and I can choose by and large the hours I, I work. I love this. This is so great. So you're living right now complete, I would say, uh, pretty much location freedom. You guys can go wherever you want to go, but you guys are choosing to stay in California right now. Yeah. And then you have time freedom as well, because it seems like for you, you have an, an incredible spouse who's able to support what you have going on. And I think both of you guys are working towards being able to have complete time freedom also. And I get the feeling too, that if she wanted to leave her job, she probably could, is yeah. my thought. But the thing is that she's choosing to continue to work the job just because I'm sure she loves it so much. That's usually how it works with people in those positions. So I love it how you guys have all three of the degrees of freedom and you're just inspiring everyone to do these incredible things. Okay, awesome. So now we know who you are, Sam, and your family. And it's just been, it's awesome to hear all of this. Let's start talking about your business in general and just some stuff about that. In general, what are some of the challenges that families face when they're trying to live abroad? And, and how do you guys help address some of those challenges? Or what's the common objections that you guys hear? Um, or what are some of the things that you guys are trying to combat the misconceptions out in the world right now? Yeah, the, one of them is the kids schooling. So for kids that are in uh, enrolled in public schools or private schools, there can be the constraint of the school calendar. Summertime programs is easy, right? That's low hanging fruit. That's when basically everybody can travel. But otherwise, we're crafting programs uh, whereby those kids can miss minimal amounts of school uh, because our programs can overlap with some vacation periods. Also, we've partnered with an organization called Pacific Preparatory that has a stable of tutors from many different disciplines located around the world, and they can provide uh, synchronous learning in all sorts of different time zones. So that can give families comfort that kids will not be falling behind in school, even if they're missing school. We also craft our programs where, whereby it's a pretty easy sell to school administrators because when you really look at what the kids will be doing, how they'll be in uh, enrolled in local schools or local camps with local kids, the mm -hmm. educational value in the life enriching value is so apparent that principals and teachers by and large are quite supportive and say, by all means go, they're gonna learn more there than they are here. <laughs> the other thing we do is we serve uh, the homeschooling market and what they refer to as the world schooling market. So families that are homeschooling or world schooling, and so they're already free of those academic calendars. And so a constraint is alleviated uh, uh, for, for them. Beyond that, uh, a big impediment for folks is God, we'd love to go spend time in some other culture, but I think we'd be lonely, who would we know? And so that's where we work with really strong local partners that have strong local networks, excellent logistics capacity, all that stuff. So they can handle the airport arrivals and all that stuff and help with accommodations and co-working space. And we find local partners that are just jazzed by this concept of not developing another cookie cutter tour, but working with families who want to come and not be like tourists, but want to stay for a longer period of time and really understand that part of the globe. And then, of course, you're going not on your just on your own, but with a bunch of other families, all of whom have applied, all of whom have kind of attested how they share a common set of core values a hell of a community arises in the months up to the trip and then certainly while there. I can imagine the excitement for all of these people to be able to go abroad and live for anywhere up to six months, or I'm sure there's visa things that has to happen too, in some cases, depending on the country. Um, I'm sure there's immunizations. And so I love the fact that you guys are on top of the logistics and, and helping to cover everything, because that's really what people need is that service to be able to plug into, to help with all of the 
to walk people through all of these things. So I, I just love this idea this so much. This is exactly what I'm probably going to be recommending or sending people your way who are interested in this location freedom piece, yet they have families. And I think there's going to be a lot of people out there. So you may be surprised at the number of people That's I may great. send your way. That's great. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about this, right? I love the fact that you're pre, that you're pre-building all of this up. What about another objection that maybe I would see is my my company won't allow me to travel for that long, or I don't have a remote working position. Do you only work with those folks who can work remotely, or how does that work in that particular case? How are you able to to make that work for the for those families? There, there are some families who come and they're able to do, say, a month-long program and they don't have to work. So kudos right. to them. But for those who do and have constraints with employers, there's various pieces of information we're able to provide that can help them make the case to the employer mm. that they're able to do the program, they'll be tax compliant, we'll have mm -hmm. secure, safe internet connections for them to use from a data security standpoint. So it's along those lines where we're able to help. Excellent. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I hit that because I'm sure there's plenty of people out there that have all these objections and I want to try to knock them down all one by one so sure. that way we can get people to work with you. Uh -huh. Okay, so how do you guys choose the locations and the communities for the families to live in? What factors do you consider when you're selecting which places to say, okay, this is a great community to set up at this particular spot. Yeah, I got it. First off, for the initial stage of our growth, we've focused on the Pacific, where we'd been living, and the Americas, where I've spent quite a bit of time. And those are locations that work well for our initial primary market, which is North America, people from the US and Canada. Now we're starting to draw people more from Europe, but at least these initial destinations work well for folks that have to work in conjunction with US North America time zones. So French Polynesia, Mexico, Colombia, Peru, um, Costa Rica. But within those places, we're looking for locations that have really attractive climate, sufficient safety, a really strong local partner, walkability, good co-working space, really reliable internet, other enticing features, and maybe there's a world heritage site or great geography or parks, family-friendly attractions. And then a key element that has to come into the place is the youth programming. So with our local partner, We've got to get it in place to where there can be a really good, reliable, culturally immersive educational program for the youngsters. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And when you guys are vetting this out, do you guys go out there and try it yourself? Or do you know exactly what questions to ask for like when you're opening up a new market? And then you have like a trusted family or like a, a chaperone or someone that you guys trust a lot to be able to say, look, look out for these things. I'm just curious how like you, you, cause you can't, if you're trying to scale to multiple locations per year, you and your family have constraints on your time where you can't be hopping around from place to do the research fully on your own. So sure, just curious sure. how that yeah, works yeah, yeah. to vet them out. Yeah. So in the earlier stages, we had done the first program in French Polynesia where we had been living. So that, that was covered. Yep. Next program, Costa Rica is a country where I had lived in two mm. different instances, knew that well. The local partner there, a prominent organization that runs, frankly, all the trips for Disney and National Geographic, a really capable team. Columbia, a colleague had gone down on a due diligence trip, a familiarization trip, as they say. I had been to Peru many times in, during previous work. So basically, um, we're going to places either where we already know the location quite well, just from previous travels, or a member of the team is going in for a familiarization trip. Perfect. I love it. Yeah. just wanted to make sure I covered that also because yeah. I'm, again, I'm just asking things. Go, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just the one other little element that in, in this day and age too, uh, uh, it can be really helpful. All the FaceTime calls we do. So 
we can scope out co-working spaces and potential accommodations by having a member of the local team walk through and through FaceTime, we're able to see anything we, we want. So yeah. we're doing a lot of that kind of those kind of virtual visits also. I love that. You're two, two birds with one stone because three, because you're vetting the local partners, you are checking the internet speed, and you're also checking yeah. the space all exactly. at the same time. Exactly. I love it. I love exactly. It. Very, Precisely. Very cool. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit more about the implications of something like this in your mind, right? Because the future of remote work, I want to ask you, do you have any part of your mission or the vision of what you're doing to impact remote work and work itself on the way, the way people live? Just wanted to hear your thoughts on whether that's part of your vision right now or how you yeah. see your business affecting remote work. Oh, yeah, because... We've had relatively senior people from major tech firms, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and others, they have gotten authorization, they've come, they've worked remotely, it's gone well. So we've got a growing set of testimonials from folks of those kind of corporations, and that's given more and more social proof that it, it can happen. And not only can it happen in a way in which data security has been maintained and people have been able to be productive, but after the first few days of being so enamored by the new culture and frankly distracted, my God, it's you're in a new place, but then people settle in and are able to be productive and focused but experiencing a hell of a lot of inspiration as well. Inspiration because you're in a new, attractive culture. You're around all these stimulating people. So there have been a lot of creative insights that folks can attest to that have come to them while away. So we see this fostering more and more approval for folks to, to be able to do this. And it won't be too long to where a program could be filled, say, just with Googlers or just with people from a particular company and from their schools that have locations in different parts of the world and online schools. And we've been in, in discussions with some of those folks because there's opportunities for our programs to be filled just with their community as a way from, for members of their community to really connect in a very meaningful way living alongside each other, uh, say on a tropical island for a month. That's so cool, man. I, I just love this so much. As someone who has been traveling for quite some time, my wife and I have been fully living the location freedom, degree yes. of freedom, as much as we can. I can completely attest to the fact that when you're more fulfilled, because we still have to work hard. Like for instance, right now I'm in Japan, so I'm in Asia and I'm talking to you with a very large time difference between us. But the amazing thing is, is that at about nine o'clock or 10 o'clock here in the morning, everyone is asleep in the United States. That's when that's about like midnight, depending on the time zone in the US, right? That's when we can fold the laptops down after finishing a full day of work and then enjoy the places that we're at, right? And usually we like to do anchor stays in each location, just like what you guys are doing, right? Except yeah. with like on steroids with a whole bunch of sure. other people that are from, from the United States where you get that chance to have your kids talk with each other and contain, re retain some sense of normal life. Yeah. What we, what I really like about this is the fact that when you're out and about and you're enjoying the culture, you're drinking in the food and the smells and the sights and you're becoming more and more like a local you, your mind expands and you start thinking globally or you start thinking about things in a different way. Yeah. Even as you learn local words and start listening to people and seeing how they talk with each other and how they live. It's just such an incredible, valuable experience that it's impossible to say that not um, just being in that environment is not going to help you in your personal and your work career. It's not possible. Like it, it definitely yeah. does do that yeah. because it widens your mind. You become more creative, more rested, yep. more organized, more intentional. And all of these things, I think, start stacking up 
to where it's just an incredible experience. And that's why you're seeing all the success. That's just my sure, opinion. Sure, yeah. And, and, and just to add to that, there's research showing that uh, people who have spent time in other cultures have better problem solving abilities because they're able to view problems from more angles, from more perspectives. That's incredible. I, yeah, and it, it doesn't surprise me at all. Okay, yeah. so we're getting close to the end of the show here. But I, I had just a few more questions, and then we're going to head into our rapid round, okay. um, which is five or six questions that I ask every guest that, you know, that we're going to rapidly fire at you here in just a minute. But let me ask you one last question here. Do you have any success stories of families who have lived abroad with you in working without borders? Like maybe a, a story about an amazing experience or something that happened as a success with their family or with business. Obviously not, you don't have to reveal the identity of this, these individuals, but I would love to hear a more personal story about someone who was forever changed because of your program. Yeah, sure. I'd love to share some, some of those anecdotes and, and let me really focus in on the, the youth because for say teenagers, man, those are formative years and that's where you can really Im Im impact somebody. So here's one example where boy, whereby a 15 year old boy was going to French Polynesia with his father, both of them big basketball aficionados. The dad's the coach, the, the kid is the like state championship uh, player. And they had a real focus on are there basketball courts on the island and any way to play basketball? And so we had done some research and we found that, you know, yes, there were. As it turns out, this teenage boy had not been out of the U.S. before and was pretty intimidated by the notion of being in this program with the local teenagers. He, he's, he says, I don't speak French or Tahitian. I'm not sure how this is going to go. I'm not sure how I'm going to connect with the other North American youth coming. There was a lot of trep trepidation, but after they, they'd been on the island for two days and the boy had experienced one day of the local camp, the father and son are driving on the island. So think of like Kauai or some of these, like a Hawaiian island where there's a single road going around the perimeter of the island. Father and son driving around the island after being there just two days, the father sees a basketball in the air over the tropical foliage. <laughs> and rightly figures that there must be a basketball court. I just saw a basketball in there. So they pull over and walk over and turns out that the local guys on the court say, hey, they recognize the teenage boy. They're in the camp oh, together. Wow. And now it turns out in that culture, the protocol is that you need to be invited onto the, the court, but he is so moments later, he's playing basketball with uh, these local teens on the, the court. And that's a case where you go from being fearful and intimidated to gaining this newfound confidence. And so it's we get to watch uh, people's comfort zones. We, we get to watch them get out of their comfort zone. We get to see the fear and the discomfort. But then we get to see the, the comfort zone catch up and, and encompass them and then just have a, a, a bigger world. This is incredible. I, I just really hope that the listeners are listening to this and trying to visualize watching these very impactful growth moments happen is just, that's magical, right? Obviously, my wife and I, we don't have kids yet, but just visualizing that and knowing it from my own eyes as an informative youth or some from my informed years as a youth going through a challenge like that is just while it's uncomfortable or hard at the beginning those kind of things tend to snowball on top of themselves right yeah. and what i really think is cool is that you and your family your kids are watching you build this business and they're taking some elements of this entrepreneur, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial type of thing, and they're starting to do stuff on their own. Um, oh, yeah. And so I really think that's incredible. And I think that your own kids, as we before we hit court, record this morning, I heard a little bit about how that's affecting you and your family. And I think that's yeah. really, really cool stuff. Yeah, the, the, the boy who just came home from school here, my 12-year-old yeah. son, has 
literally in 34 minutes, he will start a Zoom call whereby people all over North America, and in this case, the UK also, have paid $20 each to have him train them to understand what chat GTP is, how to access it, how to use it in a bunch of different ways, how to understand its limitations and the key caveats. So here's a guy who's uh, <laughs> already on his way to the three degrees of uh, freedom. I love it. That's so cool. All right. And not only that, but he and I are, have put together a program called the Gen AI Academy, by which we're, we're training other young people to deliver the same training in other parts of the world. How cool is that? Oh my gosh, amazing stuff. And that that helps feed your relationship with your with your oh, son. Yeah. And it gives them incredible skills to be able to use outside of school. I just love it. I just love everything that you guys are doing here. And so this is this has been really great. So before we end up closing out the show here, I want to do a few things. So first we'll go into the rapid round and then I want to invite you to have an open floor to talk about anything you want to, whether it's how people can get in, in touch with you or anything that you'd like to say. But if you're ready, we'll jump into the rapid round right now and we ask go. you five or six questions. Okay. Each Bring one of these on. questions, I ask every one of my guests, um, and they're meant to be answered in about a 30 second time frame or less. So okay. you're ready to go. Let's go. Let's yeah. do it. Number one, name any resource that was or is essential in your journey to pursue your own freedom and inspire others for freedom. Yeah. There are a bunch of Facebook groups on world schooling. So just go to Facebook, look for groups, type in world schooling. You'll see a whole bunch of them. Some of them have over 50,000 members all over the globe who are incredibly active. So this is for families with kids, whether young kids or teenagers, any part of the globe that you're interested in going to experience or live in, those are resources where it's astounding how many people are saying, we're there, or we were just there, or we're on our way there too, or we'll see you there. That's the key resource. Oh, I love it. That's so great. Number two, if you woke up and your business was gone and you had $500, a laptop, a place to live and some food, what do you think you would do first to rebuild? I would focus on what I mentioned earlier, this Gen AI Academy, because right now this little guy is killing it, tra training folks in ChatGPT. He's also got B2B clients. A local business has hired him to help them figure out how to use ChatGPT <laughs> for content generation, but still having an authentic brand. So I would focus on that so that humanity has a whole bunch of young people who really understand AI and can help folks of all generations to, to use it effectively. Very cool. Nice, nice. Number three, what does your self-reflection and goal setting practice look like if you have one? Yeah, I start my days with a, a priming exercise. It's along the lines of what Tony Robbins does and is famous for. In fact, just type in Tony Robbins priming and you'll see a 15 minute guided video but it's along those lines whereby I start my day getting myself into a peak state. I focus on my key goals, experiencing them as if they're already my reality. So I'm helping my nervous system to, to get used to the idea of it really being my re reality. I'm doing breathing exercises and movements that kind of is getting my heart rate up. So I do that typically before the rest of the family's awake so that when they do wake up, daddy's already in a pretty good mood and, and uh, firing on all cylinders. I love it. <laughs> all right. Number four, what are the core work habits that you attribute most to your success? I think it's my ability to get really clear on why I'm pursuing a goal like the seven le le levels deep to have it be such that it's not just about me personally or even just my own family, but it's serving a larger purpose, serving a, a market of folks that I can fall in love with and really be passionate about understanding them and their needs and how to serve them. 
that above all. And then somehow about however I'm conditioned or wired to just focus and persevere and get through the dark times to bring stuff to fruition. Yeah. One of the things that I said with my previous guests, one of my favorite quotes is a quote from Jim Rohn, I think, that mm -hmm. is, if the why is big enough, then the how gets some legs. There you, you know? go. And yeah. So I think that's an amazing thing to be able to reflect on that and really make sure that you understand what that is and you're just living it right now. So that's perfect. Yeah. All yeah, right. Yeah. Number five, what books do you recommend to people who want to jumpstart their own success if they're starting their own business? If they're starting their own business, the Pour Your Heart Into It by Howard Schultz. The Starbucks book was a good one. The, the E-Myth was an, uh, another good one. But it may be such that rather than books, there are at this day and age, there might be YouTube videos, practically speaking, that uh, you, you go to get some lessons. I completely agree. Or maybe it's a YouTube video on those books. <laughs> because yeah, there's exactly. A lot of those. There's a lot of those. But yeah, no, I completely agree. Definitely. This is a new age for sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Last question I have for you is what tool or process has become one of your most important time, money, or energy saving ninja magic tricks that you use every day? Yeah. What my son had showed me a few months ago, the chat GTPD, hundreds of millions of folks now growing so fast every day, faster than the adoption of any other app in history, apparently, chat GPT and pay the 20 bucks for the GPT the premium. version. It's so much smarter, so much better. But like a lot of folks, and I'm using that and it's incredibly boosts the productivity. Yeah, it's incredible. And then all the stuff that's coming out with auto GPT as well is incredible also. And so I'm excited to talk with you about that maybe off the show mm -hmm. since we're running out of time here. But before we go for the day, uh, I want to ask you, Sam, how can people get in touch with you or learn about what you have to offer? through working without borders please let us know uh, right. how we can learn more great working without borders we're on uh, working without borders.com is the website you can find us on facebook instagram and by all means you'll find my contact info and feel free to reach out email text whatsapp i'd, I'd love to hear from folks excellent and i encourage people to go ahead and do that especially if You've been thinking about trying to find a way to work in a different culture and get some different, get some, get, get a location change in, in a pattern interrupt, right? Using someone else's systems and processes to be able to have your family work in a different, or you and your family work and go to school in a different location is a hundred percent attainable. Um, and I think someone like Sam has completely thought through everything and there's no reason for you to try to do this all yourself. Um, Sam's got all the logistics down. He knows what works uh, and he'll put you in a community of other people that are just like you, quite frankly. So that way you can really thrive together and grow some incredible relationships, experiences, and just personal growth in general. So, Sam, thank you so much for coming on the show. This was incredible to talk about and I loved it. I loved every minute. Me too, Derek. <laughs> awesome. And for you listeners who have listened all the way to the end, thank you guys so much for doing so. So wherever you're watching or listening to this, please make sure you like, subscribe, comment, engage with us. We just want to hear from you so that we can have more incredible guests like Sam on the show and then also appease the algorithm gods to get more and more listeners just like you exposure to this great content. Appreciate you and uh, Sam, once again, thank you so much. And dear listeners, great to have you on the show. We'll see you next week. Take care.